Hi, this is Andrew Wolf here. In this video, I am going to introduce the uh, pathophysiology of anemia. Now, anemia is a very large topic, and there are many, many etiolo etiologies to it. And uh, in this video, though, I want to focus on, um, first of all, a uh, sort of straightforward, systematic way of approaching any patient with anemia to sort of help you to um, figure out uh, what the diagnosis is or what the differential diagnosis is at least. And second of all, I want to talk about some of the more common causes of anemia. Now I'm going to create a second video on anemia where I talk about acute blood loss anemia and acute effects of blood loss and then also the uh, chronic effects of anemia over time. Uh, but in this video, I'm uh, mostly going to focus on uh, the pathophysiology of the anemia itself and the etiology. Okay, so uh, anemias can be caused by three different things. Uh, first, they can be caused by blood loss. And second, they can be caused by decreased red blood cell production. And third, it can be caused by increased RBC destruction. Okay. So those are sort of three categories, and this is really sort of a good systematic way to start thinking about a patient that has anemia. Are they having blood loss? Are they uh, having decreased production? Or are they having increased um, red blood cell destruction? In this country, the major manifestation of blood loss anemia is called iron deficiency anemia. Now. Iron deficiency anemia also can be caused by malnutrition. However, this is a very rare cause in the developed world. It is um, more likely to be seen in uh, very rural, uh, poor communities. Uh, but if you see iron deficiency in this country, it is most often caused by blood loss. Now, the blood loss um, is most commonly caused by GI losses. Now, if you have a patient that is a male and um, has iron deficiency anemia, the first thing that you want to look at is the possibility of GI losses. With, um, with women, the other possibility is menorrhagia, or heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, GI losses can be due to peptic ulcer disease. Uh, NSAID use or inflammatory bowel diseases and last but not, not least malignancy. So if you have a patient with iron deficiency anemia you think this patient needs a GI workup at the very least they need an occult blood smear scent and if it's positive they're going to need a scope um, because you don't want to make an assumption that is one of these benign diseases, you need to rule out malignancy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, what's going on inside the cells and inside the bone marrow when we have iron deficiency. So, um, if you remember, iron is the central element in heme. So here we have iron with its chemical symbol Fe and uh, iron is surrounded by molecules nitrogen and cysteine and e actually there's four different types of, of hemoglobin and I don't have them all memorized but the, it essentially looks something like this um, there's four different types and each type is slightly different but they're all surrounded by um, by nitrogen and then these um, 
other carbon and hydrogen molecules. Something like that. But it's important to recognize that what happens here is um, the iron is fully bound and sort of stabilized um, by because it has covalent bonds with four nitrogen um, with four nitrogen atoms and so typically oxygen forms a strong um, covalent bond with iron so you end up with iron oxide or ferric oxide right however oxygen is still attracted to the iron However, um, because the iron is stabilized by its uh, covalent bonds with the nitrogen, the um, bond with oxygen is weak and reversible. So here, let me draw that as a dotted line. And remember, each heme molecule can hold, can bind with one oxygen. And there are four hemes, heme groups. There are four heme groups in one molecule of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is this, um, what's called a tetramer, which means uh, it has four parts, four heme groups connected together um, with the globin, with a globin protein that makes up the hemoglobin. And iron's in the center. So what happens if we don't have enough iron? Well, the body cannot create hemoglobin. So we end up with de decreased hemoglobin. Now, the body's first, so here we are. We're going to um, tell our story here in the bone marrow. And so here we are in the bone marrow. And again, I'm drawing it in the long bone here, but you remember that in adults, the um, active um, hematopoiesis is occurring actually in the flat bones. But just so you know, we are in the bone marrow. What's occurring here is that because we have decreased hemoglobin, because we have decreased iron, we have decreased hemoglobin, and because we have decreased hemoglobin, the body is just going to produce fewer red blood cells than usual in the bone marrow. And so we are going to have decreased red blood cells in the bloodstream. So early on, if you tested someone's blood, they would you would all you would find is decreased red blood cells. The red blood cells would look normal. Right, because the body's responding to the decreased amount of hemoglobin um, by just creating fewer red blood cells. However, what's going to happen is because we have decreased red blood cells, we now have decreased oxygen carrying capacity. And when we have decreased oxygen carrying capacity, our kidneys detect this and they send out erythropoietin, erythropoietin, EPO, and this message gets sent to the bone marrow, and then the bone marrow actually gets revved up. Now it's revving up the myeloid line, so the myeloid line includes red blood cells, and platelets. Now what happens then is the next phase of iron deficiency anemia is we now have more red blood cells getting cranked out. Lots and lots of red blood cells now. So this is what happens first. We have fewer red blood cells. Second, we have more red blood cells, but we still have a deficit of heme. So these red blood cells are going to be small because they're not packed with hemoglobin. 
and they're going to be hypochromic. Each red blood cell is going to be deficient in hemoglobin. And not uncommon in this phase, we're also going to be uh, we're also going to see a thrombocytosis. And this has to do with the epoietin revving up the myeloid line to produce. If you do a standard CBC now, um, you may have a normal red blood cell count, but they're going to be microcytic and hypochromic. And you may also see a thrombocytosis. Now, if you want to diagnose iron deficiency anemia, you need to think about, you need to check some other labs as well. Now, remember, in the liver and in the spleen, if you remember my discussion of the iron cycle in the previous slide, iron is stored in the liver and the spleen um, connected to a protein called apoferritin, and when iron is connected to that protein, it becomes ferritin. Okay, so if we have the addition of iron. Now, if we have a person with iron deficiency anemia, one of the easiest ways to confirm this diagnosis is to find a decreased ferritin level. Now, this is really the most, uh, the simplest way to diagnose it. You cannot diagnose it from decreased iron levels because most of the iron in the body is not freely circulating. In fact, a very, very small proportion of it is. Most of the iron is being stored in ferritin. Now, if you check a ferritin level and it's normal and you still suspect um, iron deficiency anemia, the one other thing that you can check that is a reliable indicator of iron deficiency anemia is a new test, a relatively new test, the transferrin receptor protein. Now the transferrin receptor protein is a protein on an erythroid precursor cell inside the bone marrow. Now remember, I talked about ferritin being the main way that the body stores iron, but the main way that that iron is transported in the bloodstream is with a protein called transferrin. So the transferrin receptor protein is the protein that binds with transferrin and allows the erythroid precursor cells to take up iron into the cell. Okay, so when a patient has, um, has anemia, has iron, in, in specifically iron deficiency anemia, the erythroid precursor cells are going to be needing to bind with more transferrin, so they are going to start producing more transferrin receptors. And some of these are going to sort of break off into the bloodstream and be in detectable levels. Um, and we can detect them with a lab test. So really there are only two lab labs that I would rely on to evaluate to definitively diagnose iron deficiency anemia. And that would be ferritin. If it's low, then you've confirmed it. If the ferritin is um, normal or low normal and you still suspect iron deficiency anemia, you could you could check a transferrin receptor protein. However, the choice that many physicians use is if they strongly suspect iron deficiency anemia, they just treat it with iron replacement. And then empirically, if the patient improves, then they feel comfortable with their diagnosis.
Okay, so those are the ways that you diagnose it and um, some of the physiology behind it so you understand the concept. Okay, I'm going to break this video up here and in my next video I will talk about the other types of the other major classes of anemia. Anemia is due to decreased red blood cell production and anemia is uh, due to increased red blood cell destruction. So please um, see me in the next video. If you want quick and easy access, please click on this link here um, to connect to the hemoglobin um, pathophysiology channel. And I will see you in the next video.